I actually was working in logistics for the e-commerce space. So like shipping technology, shipping rates, stuff like that. And, um, I, you know, I, I liked doing that in a sense, like it's a, it's a really fascinating space to me, but I kind of, kind of got tired of working for somebody else, so to speak. So I, I started looking for entrepreneurship, you know, startup opportunities. And it's kind of one of those things where like a random friend on LinkedIn said, Hey, does anybody want to go join an early stage e-com SaaS startup to run marketing? And put my hand up and next thing you know, I'm meeting the founder of Q pilot and he built a subscription app that's geared towards delivery and shipping outcomes. So it was kind of like one of those weird things of like an extension of what I had already been doing, um, for, for both of us. So for me, that was kind of like, that's how I got started, at least introduced to it. Like I think most people, when you think of subscriptions, they don't seem overly complex. You know, it's a widget on your site and the product shows up once a month kind of thing. But then when you really get into it, it, it's, it's pretty sophisticated, like any aspect of like selling or retail. So that's kind of like what got me into it and what's keeping me coming back to it is I just think it's really, really interesting with where the space is going. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the space is definitely evolving from someone that is not a hundred percent in subscription like you are. I mean, I've seen, uh, from an outside perspective that there was this business model for a long time of, you know, low cost barrier of entry, or at least a lot of companies were doing that dollar shade club, Harry's razors, for example, where you get a, like a $5 starter kit, but then you would get into the subscription and they were banking on that lifetime value. Mm -hmm. And I feel, or I've seen, um, through working with Facebook ads with companies that were doing subscription, that the front end CPA just keeps rising year over year, which makes it more and more right. difficult to bank on that. So where do you see, is that business model of, you know, low barrier of entry with a starter kit or a minimal cost and then hoping lifetime value will, you know, play out still working? Or do you see people kind of adapting to something different? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. I think it's it's a little bit of both. Um, so like the Dollar Shave Club models, I would say um, a, a similar model might be something like a, you know, your subscription boxes, right? Like a uh, gentleman's box or, um, you know, carnivore club or something like that, where you're getting a monthly or quarterly a stitch fix is another one. A, a lot of those, a lot of like the stitch fixes of the world are, are having issues. Um, they've scaled to a really big point and then are facing like still rising customer acquisition costs and high operation costs. I think for a lot of brands that are trying to go with that banking on the high LTV thing that they are facing some issues. I think it's the brands that are starting to like really do well are the ones that where the acquisition is in line with the subscription and, and a way of doing that for a lot of them is products that can be bought both one time or subscription, right? So like you think of your pet foods or CBDs, really big supplements, cosmetics. So it's something that you do use on a fairly regular basis. Dollar Shave Club is exclusively like subscription. That's how they started out. And some brands are launching exclusive subscriptions, but other, but others have like, they launched, I launched a, say a, a cosmetics line. And then now I want to add subscriptions as a, as a component. And so for them, it's a little bit different because they already have acquisition channels that they're now trying to just capture more recurring revenue. Um, and so that is starting to like, I think that's just growing and growing and growing. And one of the main reasons why it's changing so much is, is like dollar shave club built out this tech stack. I, I'm a, I'm a subscriber bald guy, but I've been on their subscription for years is it's very, very easy to manage that. I can make that schedule quite literally whatever I want, add in other things like my handle broke the other day. So I just went in and, um, added another handle to my next order. Didn't change the shipping at all. Um, they built that kind of a tech stack, but the experience is on the end user. You have complete control. You, you don't have to worry about getting too much, or if you get too much, I just go in and pause it for three months and it kicks back on again. It's like super personalized to me. The problem for a long time with subscriptions is the technology was hard to do that right for yourself. And so Shopify and the rise of like their subscri their shop, their subscriptions API and opening up so many other apps, like there, like there's advancements in this technology that's empowering these like great customer experiences. And so I think subscriptions are just going to keep growing and growing and making it easier for people to launch that as a part of their business or their so core business. You're saying like before it was cancel or keep as it yep. goes now, there's a lot more options. And are you seeing lifetime value or just length of subscription increase substantially? For for a lot of brands, yes. And especially across industries, like um, food is an interesting one. Like food, um, their their order frequency is a little bit higher, um, but the, the LTV there is just growing because more and more people are becoming more comfortable with ordering their food online. Like CBD is fairly new. Um, 
So it, it depends from industry, but also within co like companies and the offerings and the type of customers you're acquiring. But yes, like the subscription revenue and brands that are like as a percentage of revenue, it is growing significantly and can, and will continue to do, I think, for the next few years at least. Yeah. And I know you were saying, um, you know, brands can have trouble, I guess, quote unquote, banking on the LTV from a uh, subscription. I mean, from a, just a business perspective, how effective have you seen subscriptions being and, you know, keeping lifetime value past that? I feel like that first two to three months is a big drop off opportunity for businesses. Are, mm -hmm. are you seeing, uh, you know, updates with subscription packages or models or offerings help with that? Yes, actually, I mean, I, I I was interviewing a brand the other day who said that they started doing a second month free right away on this as a subscription offer. So you subscribe and you get your second month free. So you hit month three right away. Like, you, you, so it's it's a means of like trying to get people past the jump, and they and they have had some success doing that. I think I think what it really comes down to though is like a lot of the the drum that I bang in the subscription space related to those first couple of months is is understanding acquisition better. It's, and that's what makes it complicated and more difficult to scale, at least in the short term is because you're trying to figure out like, why are people subscribing to this? Is somebody just messing around? Is somebody just there for the discount? Is there a really strong problem solution alignment? Um, you know, depending on the brand, it might be a usage thing, right? Like if I were to say, for example, I, I subscribe to some hair growth product, I've never used it before. So maybe the first couple of months, I'm not in the habit of using it. So like, you know, maybe that brand needs to invest more in UGC and guides and things to like help me create a habit to get that sticking. So I think a lot of it has to do with part, it's partially offer, but it's partially like understanding who's coming in there and then why are they leaving? And that's a lot of the, like the work and the analysis that I do is to try to help brands figure out like, what is the actual problem here? Cause throwing a discount to get somebody to stick longer because they don't like your product isn't going to work. Yeah, I remember during Black Friday, Cyber Monday last year, 2022, Love Wellness had an offer where it was, um, you subscribe, you get a discount the first month, but the second month you get a mystery bottle of mm -hmm. one of their products for free to kind of tie you in or keep you looped in there. Um, what what tools or, you know, what uh, apps and Shopify are you using or are brands using to help get that information from customers? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a ton of subscription apps themselves. Um, I would say... And I'll come back to those because that's kind of part of a lengthy discussion. I think, I think Clavio is an obvious must have for any e-commerce brand, and they're regularly rolling out products and features related to surveys and checking with customers, and that you can link in for products and upsells. So that's like a guarantee for AOV stuff. I think for post-purchase stuff, you should be using things like No Commerce or Bestie to survey. And uh, Bestie is an interesting one because they're like, I, I think actually No Commerce is doing this as well, where like they can see whether it's a subscription or not and ask somebody why they subscribed or why they didn't subscribe. So like you can do that as part of a post-purchase post -purchase survey, which is really, really critical. Um, then for other uh, technologies, when we're talking about cancellation surveys and things like the Winback campaigns, you've got Churnbuster, Upzello that are doing a great job of like trying to make it a more sophisticated offer when somebody's leaving and knowing who to make that offer to instead of just like throwing a free product or a free month at somebody that no longer really want your product. Um, those would probably be the core ones I would say you would want to start with. Um, and then talking about apps, it really does. There's a lot like, re obviously like recharge and bold have been, they were the OGs of subscription apps on Shopify. Um, I think some of them, there's, there's quite a few that have come up in the last year, year and a half that, that are looking really interesting. Um, stay AI is one that I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of because they're doing a lot of really great work from a retention and boosting AOV side, um, atomic, um, I think are some great ones as well. And then, um, you know, the one that I work with is called auto ship cloud and we're doing stuff around delivery. So like really, really specific ship use cases around shipping and delivery outcomes, um, which is pretty exciting. But I, I think really a lot of times the question is, is like, not so much the software, but understanding what is actually driving the subscription revenue for you. Is it flexibility? Is it customers being able to swap out products? Is it the upsell options? Like knowing what the core business drivers are, you have to identify that. And then it makes picking software, I think, a lot easier because then you go and find out what their actual top like value props are and go with those. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, with from the, the acquisition standpoint, because that's, you know, the area that we work in. A lot of it comes down to offer, and I, I was looking through some of your um, videos on YouTube and saw continue to talk about how you know offer is very important. Don't just focus on you know discount 
really focus on what you're offering people. Do you see businesses um, working to create a you know, unique package or offering for their subscription and that works better than just, you know, a discounted percentage off for the same product in a recurring or what does that look like uh, from clients you work with? Yeah, it, it does depend on the product type. I think, um, you know, the idea of like, you're talking about something, I, I, I call it like a life-changing product versus like maybe a commodity. So like the idea is like a commodity might be like vitamin C, for example. And so you're not going to win somebody necessarily with a special bundle on a commodity, unless it's like a group package of like, you know, uh, maybe it's a men's health bundle and it's vitamin C and a daily vitamin and like, you know, something else, right. Right. Like that, like, as opposed to say like a life changing prod product or a life changing offer, right. Like say, like, I, I would think of those, like I take CBD for sleep as a good example. So for me, it's like, what, what creative ways can you package a, a product to get me to try it? it, it and, and that, and that's where I say like, sometimes understanding like the, the, this particular value prop, like there are brands I know of that do great out of the, right out of the gate, they offer the subscription and they converts and they retain other brands, try that and it, they fail. So they, they, but they succeed at getting people to try the product and then upselling them into a subscription after the fact. And, and a lot of that does come down to like, do customers need to try your product to have trust? Is there a messaging issue? Is there an offer issue? And so like, you know, as I'm sure you've seen like acquisition stuff, like a lot of brands don't test offers that often regardless of whether it's a subscription or not. So that's one thing that's always like, can you be a little bit more creative with how you're offering free shipping? Um, I think what I saw the other day that I thought was really cool was, um, badass coffee out of Toronto. They were selling a kind of like a, they sell mugs with their coffee. So they have these really cool branded mugs that you can buy with a coffee. Now you're not going to get a mug on a subscription, but it's a great intro offer to try the, the coffee kind of thing. So I think it's just ways of like trying to come up with economical ways to be more creative and getting people to try it or understanding really clearly what somebody's expecting and then making sure you just deliver on that really well. Yeah. And I had somebody on here uh, recently that was really focusing on the idea of community building. And, you know, I feel that uh, community can add a whole nother layer to subscriptions and, you know, help LTV because they're part of a community and they're part of, you know, a, a culture or a group. Are you seeing that with any brands that you're working with or any false there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and coming back to your like tech stack question, um, I think there's some really interesting options like Smarter is a subscription app that is doing like they do loyalty points with subscriptions. Yotpo that has been doing loyalty and reviews for a long time now is a subscription offer. And I'm a fan of uh, what I'm seeing coming out of Inveterate. Um, they're a new loyalty program. Um, yeah, I think so because really realistically, like I think a fundamental understanding of subscriptions is, is really, it's not about recurring revenue. It's about engaging with your best customers. So anybody who's buying your product on repeat, either at, at the very least trusts the product, whether they like the brand or not, they at the very least trust the product. So we're thinking about communities are, are ways of people that are coming up with unique offers. One that I have personally that I'm a fan of, I'm, I'm training for a, a triathlon right now is X Endurance. And they have this program where you can subscribe basically to be a member for a year. And it basically gives you a, an account credit on the store plus free shipping on all your orders. It's, it's like a hundred bucks and you get a hundred dollar credit and free shipping. It's kind of a no brainer if you're going to buy the product more than once or twice. And then on their side, it's like that offsets a lot of the free shipping costs that they give to people. Right. And then a store credit just means you're spending more money. And so it's like, that's, I, I don't know how long it took them to arrive at that offer, but it was a no brainer for me. And so that, that to me is like where a lot of this, like this loyalty community part is, is like, oh, now I'm also a member of like this great community of people that like that product and are training for activities and stuff like that. So loyalty and community, I think are the best ways to sell, to sell into that because it, again, it creates this community of your best customers, allows you to engage with them, reward them more. And as, as they, I'm sure for X endurance and for other brands like them, it's like, they know that I'm now a more profitable customer for them long-term. Yeah. You're, is this your first triathlon? Yeah. Yeah. How, how'd you hear about them? Did you hear from someone else running them? Or? Well, no, actually it was one of those weird things. So I do a lot of free consults with brands where I just like, you know, I like on Twitter, somebody's asking a subscription question and I start to answer and I'm like, look, let's just drop, jump on a call. Because a lot of times, like 
a lot of times brands are like, you know, you're staring at the same thing every day. So it's an outsider can come in and, and, and that's what I do well. So I, I point out, okay, here's here. Anyway. So I, I did that with them. So we ran through their subscription program and he started telling me about his product and I'm like, wait a second. And so he sent me a free thing. And then next thing, you know, it's like, I think he's, you know, I, I hope that what I did helped their subscription program, but I know they've got a high LTV customer now because their product works. It like it, it legit works and I love it. And I'm going to be a customer for as long as I'm doing anything endurance related. I'll be buying a lot of their stuff. So <laughs> well, that's a good, that's a good program. They have, so you opt in for a year. Um, and I mean, they have a lot of runway there businesses that are going, let's just say month to month with their subscriptions. Are you seeing any businesses using a software they're on top of tracking and seeing when their drop-offs are happening? Are they implementing any sort of, uh, proactive email or proactive SMS to try and combat that drop. Yes. Time. Yeah. So that, that is, that is exactly what a lot of brands are doing. And one of the biggest, um, things that I usually identify or will point out for somebody is like, okay, your software will tell you like they'll look at it month to month, like say, like take recharge, for example, it's just a simple cohort analysis of customers that bought in January, February, March, and how they're performing month one, month two, right? So you can see, so for me is I, I, I hate the average life, the average life cycle metric for a subscription because it's, it's just an average. It doesn't tell you anything because you have a high month one drop off and you, then you have customers who stand for two years. So it's like, okay, if I'm dropping 5%, 5% or 10%, 10% and then 5%, 5%, it's that 10 to 5%. Th those are my, that's my trouble months, right? The biggest changes. And so you, the, the trick though, is you have to understand why that's happening. And so that's what I was saying like earlier is like, if you're using post cancellation surveys and also interviewing customers, you have to use like a qualitative one. And then you need to marry that. This is where it gets a little bit tricky is you need to marry that with data related to post-purchase expectations. Why is somebody signing up for the product? What are they expecting to get? And then what's happening? That's where the cancellation comes in and why. And so a really good example of this is like, um, one of our customers is iHeartDocs and they have this great offer for pet food. Uh, they donate a portion of sales to feed shelter pets. It's just, a, it's a great little program. So they were running subscriptions for a while and just collecting this data. And they found, you know, like most subscription brands, uh, top reasons for cancellation was too much product, but it's always the why, right? Like why, like a skincare brand, the why is I I'm not in the habit of using it. Theirs was, they didn't know how much to order. And so they went back and redesigned their product page to explain better to people and made it more interactive. So depending on your size dog, it ought to into a different frequency. Now that kind of development's expensive. You don't want to come right out of the gate doing that, although it's cool without being fed, like influenced by data. And then what happens is conversions go up and retention goes up because now you have customers, you're explaining to customers, they're not getting too much product. And so the other part of that is like, again, if it's, um, you know, people aren't using the product, I'd say invest in UGC, create more content around usage. Uh, use inserts and other things to like remind people to use the product, send at, ask people like, this is insane. This is an insane idea, but if it's a healthcare product that somebody doesn't have a habit on, tell them that they don't have a habit of that. Would they like to opt into a weekly or every other day text reminder to use the product? Asking people to opt into something that like that can be really powerful, right? Like that's something to test. Right. Exactly. So, so, or is it, the product is too expensive or I'm not sure I'm seeing value. It's like, okay, well, if I'm not seeing value, do you want to commit to a longer commitment and we'll take, uh, give you a discount. So it's, again, it's understanding what is happening and then it allows you to be proactive to get people into that month three, month four, we'll stick around for forever. And you said that flexibility plays into that too, with being able to change your, you know, quantity or your specific right. product or even your retail date. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and again, that's the thing I was mentioning with most subscription apps now are like advancing in that area where it used to be really inflexible, but most of them are now offering an option for your website where it's easy for a customer to like see in a portal when they're getting it or, or when their order is processing and what their schedule of frequency is or adding in other products, stuff like that. Yeah. And I, look, I know this is every business is going to have a different uh, opportunity or different issue. So to try to categorize this into like a one size fits all answer, go and preface this by saying, that's not what we're looking for. But, um, you know, you're talking about flexibility as an opportunity. Are there any other tactics or opportunities that you see businesses doing to work to increase lifetime value, um, on their subscription? 
Yeah. So I think the biggest one is upsells. So, um, depending on the, the breadth of your SKU catalog, right. Um, if you're selling one thing, then upsells, uh, might not work for you, but then I would be leaning into the community part and maybe looking at product development based off the types of problems you're solving. Um, otherwise upsells a really big deal. Um, it's not always post-purchase. Um, sometimes people need to use your product a few times and then like I tried X endurance as skincare stuff. I never would have brought skincare from a D to C brand, but their endurance stuff works. So, uh, you know, month three is when I decided to like, try that. Um, so uh, upsells is a big deal because then you can capture more value sooner. Um, the other part of, from the LTV standpoint, I think it, it, it comes down to like use understanding why people are using the product, um, how often they're using it. Um, can you solve more problems for them? So it's a little bit more in depth of like, um, trying to like understand more about what the customer's doing. Otherwise I would just look at the acquisition channels to see if I can become more um, efficient at acquiring the right type of profitable customer. Like, you know, if it's a 45 year old white guy living in Tennessee, that's going to be the guy who sticks around for three years in the subscription. And that's who I'm going to hound with my Facebook ads kind of thing. Right. Um, would be the other part of it. Yeah. I've had people on here for acquisition and retention and all the different uh, parts of marketing. I keep hearing the same thing, which is, Get on the phone with a customer, you know, mm -hmm. make make a phone call, one call per week if you can. Really understand, because if you don't, if you're just assuming why people are purchasing, you have trouble with your acquisition, but also your retention and subscription as well. So Yep. Yeah, it's one the one thing I like to say is like again, I take C B D for sleep. Like it's it's really specific. It's I have a problem falling back asleep. It's not falling to sleep first off. So don't assume that that's why I'm buying it. Like assume it's like, I feel like I don't get quite as deep sleep as I'd like to. So a product that talks about deeper, longer sleep is going to be more motivating to me than a product that's like, you know, best sleep of your life or whatever crap. So being specific, I think is where the power is in reaching customers. Love it. And not to deter anybody from doing this, but do you ever see businesses come to a point where they realize maybe their current product is not a subscription type product or does it normally come down to the offer and the messaging? Like how does a business know if they've tapped out in their efforts with this? That's a really good question. That's one that I don't get asked very often actually. <laughs> um, I, you know, usually what happens is people hit a subscription wall, which is like they are not acquiring customers as efficiently compared to how they're losing them. Like they're churning people at a rate and it's not like it's not always like the amount of the same amount of customers coming in or the same amount of customers going out. It has to do with the cost of acquiring those customers as well. Um, and so that's, that, that's usually the most common issue. I think, yeah, there, there are some, and it, and it really just comes down to like, if you can do one time really well and you can capture LTV with good repurchase rates, like my friend was running a, was running a skincare brand for a while and their sales process involved a lot of specials and discounts throughout the year. So like their customers were already trained to order around certain special dates. So when they would do a subscription offer, it wouldn't get as much traction because people were already buying in a different way. So I think it's things like that, that you just have to get and understand, like, you know, am, am I selling in an effective way already? Do I have a good repeat buy rate? Then maybe I don't need a subscription. Like maybe because uh, the, the worst thing you would do is you offer a subscription and now you have all these other loyal customers that don't want a subscription and they feel like they're getting cheated because of the discount for a subscription is better than what they're getting, right? So it's like, think about your best customers and what they want. Like, is it is it automation? Is it the repeat delivery piece? Is it convenience? Like, if so, then look at a subscription. If it's something else, then maybe it's not. No, that doesn't make sense. And I will say, I see in the sustainability um, space a lot, a lot of times it comes with subscription and there can be issues with, you know, we audited an ad account one time and um, their problem was that their product was so heavy to ship that they were having trouble with their front end acquisition and they weren't really getting the lifetime value that way. So, um, no, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, heavy shipment. Now you're speaking my language for shipping stuff. <laughs> oh, no, that's where you started off, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we, you know, we cap off every episode with three rapid fire questions. I know I've been throwing a lot of them at you, but these are the ones that we ask everybody who's been on the podcast. So if you had to summarize everything we discussed into a marketing mindset, what mindset should marketers and business owners have to implement subscription model into their business? Think engagement. Think of how you can engage more, learn more. And then that also comes with getting more from your customers. 
And this is my favorite question for anyone listening that is at the stage of figuring out what they'd like to do in the marketing industry. What role or roles would you say will have the highest demand or opportunity in the next three to five years? Hmm. I mean, I'm sure everybody's saying AI right now, but I think still it's has, I think content is still going to play king. The ability to understand how to explain complicated topics, relatable topics, whether you're selling in D2C or B2B, content is going to be king for a long, long time. AI is just going to supplement that. Um, so I think content is the place to be. Yeah, creative strategy is to content. That is one that comes up a lot. I was thinking the other day, I feel like AI, the great use of it right now is it minimizes the time it takes us to translate thoughts to text because right. we can just have the AI do that and then quickly say, you're wrong, fix that really quick versus... Yes you know, it having all of the strategies itself. So exactly. Um, okay. And tell us where can listeners connect with you and learn more about you and your business? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter, um, Matthew Holman on LinkedIn subscription doc on Twitter. I've got a newsletter that I send out every week with subscription tips. Um, you can find, find the link to that on either of those platforms and anybody wants to talk subscriptions, just let me know. It's something I do all day. Awesome. Thanks for coming on the show, Matthew. This was good. Thank, thank you, Colby.